Hi, it's Musharraf Hussain with the subject of interpreting taxing statutes. Our today's topic is civil and criminal law. Based on the restitution and retribution of corrective justice, law is classified as civil and criminal. A law providing restitution. Restitution means compensation or damages is categorized as civil or private law. A law providing for punishment or retribution, retribution which arises from our instinct for vengeance, for revenge, for avenging. So the law providing for punishment is categorized as criminal or public law. In civil law, the responsibility of the wrongdoer transgressor is to the extent of law sustained by the injured and is termed as civil liability. The case is processed at the discretion of the injured. So if the injured does not want, does not wishes to pursue the case, he is free for that. And it is processed under civil procedure. Rather, the Civil Procedure Code, 1908. Here, if the injured being the plaintiff, the injured and the wrongdoer being the defendant, the case title will be X versus Y. Examples of civil law are Indian Contract Act, Negotiable Instrument Tax, etc. In criminal law, the responsibility of the wrongdoer transgressor is to the state, that is society at large, and is termed as criminal liability. The case is processed at the discretion of the state under the criminal law procedure, that is Criminal Procedure Code 1973. It may be noted that the injured may or may not be interested in the pursuance of the case, but since the wrong is against the society is of such a nature that it is a evil of the society. The society is at peril or in danger for that. So it is the state who pursues this crime. The injured being the victim, the state being the plaintiff and the wrongdoer being the defendant. So the case title of um, criminal cases is a state versus Mr. X, Y, whatever, whoever is the wrongdoer. Victim. Victim is represented by a state here. Examples of criminal law are Indian Penal Code, Prevention of Corruption Act, etc. Now we have seen that criminal cases, the society is in peril, is at danger. So in criminal cases, severity of sanction is there, means the wrongdoer may be imprisoned. So the defendant is treated with great indulgence than in civil cases. The procedure as well as the rules of evidence are modified in order to reduce to a minimum the risk of an innocent person being punished. One might have heard that let the hundred people go unpunished, hundred wrongdoer go unpunished, but not the one innocent be punished. The accused in a criminal case is not called upon to prove anything. He is not bound to make any statement to the court. He is not compelable to answer any question or to give any explanation. It is left to the prosecution to prove the existence of all the facts necessary to constitute the offence charged. And lastly, if there is any reasonable doubt regarding the guilt of a person charged with a crime, the benefit of it is always given to the accused. 
as noted by Huda, Shamsul Huda in his book of Law of Crimes in 2011, page 6. Saying the severity of the criminal cases, two vital maxims need to be fulfilled. One is Mansriya and another is Nalla Pana Sanilage. Mansriya means guilty mind or intent. A very famous maxim, Actus non facitrium, nisi mensitria. The act itself does not make a man guilty unless his intention was so. Is a dictum as old as criminal law itself. This principle is not an artificial principle on any particular system of laws, but it is a doctrine of universal application based on man's moral sense. So, mere an act just become a crime. For becoming a crime, it must be backed by the guilty mind or the intention. Now, in an act, mensria is indicated by a specific words. So, words denoting guilty mind are found in the definition of an offense, such as voluntarily, intentionally, knowingly, fraudulently, dishonestly, corruptly, malignantly, wantonly, rashly, negligently, headlessly, etc. Two examples here we will take, one of IPC, another of CGST. In IPC 193, section 193, which provides for punishment for false evidence, that is commonly known as perjury. Here you can see how it has been defined. Whoever intentionally, notice the word intentionally, gives false evidence in any stage of a judicial proceeding. So before a judicial, in, uh, before a judicial uh, state or a judge, or in that proceeding, if someone gives a false evidence intentionally then of course there will be an, uh, it will be an offense and punishment has been provided similarly whoever intentionally gives or fabricates false evidence in any other case first was in the stage of a judicial proceeding the second case in any other case if someone gives or fabricates false evidence, then also he will be under this offense of section 193 of IPC. So the word intentionally establishes the mens rea here, which the prosecution need to specifically prove that he has done, he has fabricated or he has given the false evidence with the criminal intention, with the malice, with the guilty intention. Similarly, we see one in taxing statutes like CGST, Central Goods and Service Tax Act, Section 74. Here it says that wherever it appears to the proper official that any tax has not been paid or short paid or erroneously refunded or where input tax credit has been wrongly availed or utilized by reason of fraud, notice the word here, by reason of fraud or any willful misstatement or suppression of fact to evade tax. Then of course, he will serve the notice, serve the show cause. Due to the severity of this case, the period here is five years. Within five years of such events like uh, discovery of short payment or erroneous refund, etc., if it is done with a guilty intention, with mens rea, as depicted here as a fraud or willful misstatement or suppression of fact, then show cause will be served and the person, if found guilty, he may be uh, required to pay interest as well as penalty. 
Now, prosecution's burden in case where the words denoting mens rea qualifies an offense, the prosecution qualifies means as an adjective, it should not be thought as a qualification, like uh, we are having BM or something like that, nothing like that. Qualify, whenever we say qualify means it, it is modifying, rather it is a modifier in grammar. So, it is modifying the word. So, whenever like intentionally or willfully by reason of fraud, all these words are qualifier, qualifier of the offense. So, the prosecution must bring home to the offender either by direct or circumstantial evidence the precise and particular element converted by these terms. So, if intentionally someone has done, then intentional intention has to be established by certain direct or circumstantial evidence. So, showing liability of a guilty mind based in the form of actual knowledge or connivance. Absence of words denoting mens rea. Now, when the in the definition of offense, if disqualifying word like intentionally, malignantly, willfully is not present, then the offense is intended to be one of absolute prohibition, calling for a strict or absolute liability. Here we will also take two examples. One is section 292 and there is again CGST section 73. Section 292, sub clause 2. It says that whoever sells, exhibits publicly, possesses, etc., any obscene book, pamphlet, etc., shall be punished on fun, uh, first conviction, uh, conviction, then again on later conviction. Now, here one may notice that whoever sells, whether he sells by having the guilty intention or not, whether he possesses with a guilty intention or not, is irrelevant here. So, whoever sells, exhibits publicly or possesses any obscene book, pamphlet, etc., he will be punished with the uh, punishment provided thereof and he, it will be treated as a crime. So, this is one of the case here it was held that mens rea did not be established by the prosecution for this very section. Now, we will see the same kind of provision of CG, in CGST. Earlier we saw that in section 74, guilty intention like by reason of fraud or willfulness statement was present. But here the provision is again same replica. Here the intention is not important. What is what has been said that where it appears to the proper officer that any tax has not been paid or short paid or erroneously refunded or where any input tax credit has been wrongly availed or utilized for any reason other than any reason other than the reason of fraud or any misuse. So here the guilty intention or the guilt, uh, I mean, the willful uh, uh, intention is uh, not thought of. So, it is just like an absolute liability. It means that if for any other reason other than the mens rea, if it is discovered that it may be due to some error that certain tax has been short paid or erroneously refunded or input tax credit has been wrongly availed or utilized, then the proper officer may give a show cows. Now, see the difference here. Here the severity is less, so the difference is in number of years. Here the number of years is three years only, but in uh, section 74, of CGST, we saw that there the number of years was 5. So, here the show cause can be served only in 3 years when 
there is unintentional cases of short payment. But in intentional cases of short payment, the period is five years from the date of short payment or anything like that. So there, severity has been increased. There, the burden is also on the Department of Tax to establish that it was done willfully or uh, the reason of fraud like that. Here he is not required to establish any such reason. He can assign any reason and uh, give a show cause. But the period in which he can give show cause is three years. Otherwise it will become time barred and he will not be able to show cause. So the defendant's burden in the case of crime, of course here the defendant will be the prosecution, the person, the prosecutor rather, on behalf of the state. The prosecution in such cases need only prove the prohibited act and it is for the defendant to bring the statutory defense. So it is the defendant's burden, not the plaintiff. Plaintiff is here the prosecution. Nalla punish sandwich. No punishment without a law authorizing it. It is based on the elementary notion of justice that the criminal law should be as fixed and as certain as possible in order that man may know in advance what conduct is criminal. It is felt to be unfair to punish a man for conduct which was not criminal when the act was done. What is demanded? the rule of law as opposed to the caprice of an official. The maxim of Nalla Pana Sign Light has been recognized in Article 21 of the Indian Constitution, which prohibits retrospective criminal legislation, commonly known as ex post facto legislation. So, it says that an offence must be certain and as we have seen earlier in the definition of law the maxim ignorantia juris non extract that someone has to be aware so the offense need to be made aware to the defendant if it is not certain to the defendant then of course he cannot be punished for that. So today if certain thing, say laughing in public, is not an offense. But tomorrow some legislation comes and say laughing in public is an offense. So tomorrow if I do that laughing, I may be punished. But today if I have done laughing in public, then of course I, uh, I cannot be uh, punished in the tomorrow's law. So, ex post facto means if something has happened, the fact has happened, then we cannot move back and bring it to the present. So, if something happened in past and at that time it was not punishable, then through a future act it cannot be punished. This is a very important protection given in Article 21 of the Indian Constitution. Now, see the nature of tax law. Tax law may be categorized as criminal law. Because aspect of criminal law is evident in offenses as non-payment of taxes, concealment of income, failure to comply with notice, etc. Even methods of recovery under tax laws reflect its criminal nature, inflection of pain, such as recovery of area as land revenue. Land revenue, uh, whenever we see that uh, it is of severe nature, because if someone does not uh, give the tax, it cannot be. Uh, forgiven or uh, 
it cannot be pardoned it has to be recovered just like land revenue is recovered deduction from salaries and other payments by the employer so if someone has not paid tax you can ask the department can ask the employer of that person to recover the tax from the salary then attachment passes which is analogous to garnishment proceeding by collecting dues from the person who owe money to the assessee so if someone suppose uh, debtor of uh, mr x is having uh, is uh, is having to pay mr x rupees 1 lakh rupees the department may ask mr x to pay 1 lakh rupees to the department instead of that person so that is a kind of attachment so on these reasons mukherji has categorically said that the tax law is a criminal law though crpc is not directly applicable for tax statutes because tax statutes are self contained codes all the provisions for uh, providing for in, uh, penal interest or uh, penalty or even imprisonment are provided in under income tax in some scenario suppose in case of imprisonment then some of the rules of crpc may become uh, may be inferred or may become applicable suppose uh, if someone has to go to jail then of course crpc etc may be may become applicable but all those provisions have been provided in the tax statute itself so crpc i mean the cases are not processed under crpc but rather the taxing statutes suppose in case uh, income tax act then it is income tax act there are so many provisions in that to provide for uh, penalty and imprisonment thank you